everyone, and welcome to the Braver Angels Roundtable podcast, where we dare to talk politics across the red-blue divide and have fun doing it. I am your co-host, Monica Guzman, and today we are taking on one of the most heated and divisive issues to challenge us in a long time, COVID vaccines. I'm here with a panel of esteemed Braver Angels leaders and friends who I'll introduce with today's check-in question. We are inching ever closer this September to the official end of summer 2021. So in 10 seconds or less, John Wood Jr., National Ambassador, what's the most memorable thing you did this summer? I did something that uh, I never do. And I took a vacation, a mini vacation. Me and my wife took a mini vacation to Solvang, California, which is a little Dutch town. And in addition to a whole bunch of great bakeries and sausage shops and whatnot, they've got a bunch of vineyards. And so we went on a wine tasting tour, four different vineyards. I'd never done that before. It was great, but I actually don't really remember anything that happened after the second one. So (laughs) Vino, Uh, Kieran O'Connor, Brave Angel CMO. I took a wonderful trip to Mexico where I not only had the opportunity to enjoy my favorite breakfast dish, huevos rancheros, but also the opportunity to explore a different culture and remind myself that America is not the only nation in the world. There you go. It's a good refresher. Alma Cook, our music ambassador. Hello. Um, Well, you guys seem to travel on vacation, uh, but I'm really not much for that. Uh, So... It's the simple things for me. My favorite summer memories were probably being around the bonfire with my friends in North Dakota. Yeah, awesome. And as for me, um, digital director of Braver Angels, I was in the mountains of Colorado, smelling like the pine trees and that sort of high altitude, fresh air. And it was just healing. I go every year and it's fantastic every year. So with that, I will tee things off to Kieran uh, to get us going on COVID vaccines. Kieran. Thank you, Monica. Yes, today we are going to be discussing the COVID vaccine, which has become one of the most divisive topics in American life. While just over half of Americans are fully vaccinated, over 100 million Americans are not. Some are outright opposed, others remain simply hesitant. The Delta variant, which now accounts for over 99% of cases, is far more contagious than the original coronavirus variant. And while the vaccine appears to remain largely effective when it comes to protecting against severe illness and death, vaccinated Americans are still getting infected and passing along the virus. And according to public health statistics, nearly 1,900 people died from COVID yesterday alone. The vast majority of them were unvaccinated. And recently, of course, the Biden administration issued new federal vaccine requirements for as many as 100 million Americans, private sector employees, as well as healthcare workers and federal contractors. And as the vaccine issue has become more and more politicized, the stereotypes are only increasing. While some liberals may picture unvaccinated Americans as all white Trump supporters who are putting their own politics ahead of their fellow citizens' health, the reality is more complicated. Republicans are disproportionately unvaccinated, but so too are many communities of color who do not necessarily lean conservative. And indeed, people distrust the vaccine for many reasons, from personal choice to fear of potential side effects to, of course, all sorts of conspiracy theories that have sprung up over the past year and a half. Here at Braver Angels, we have a way to invite both left and right to come together to explore the strengths and weaknesses of their own positions without losing their minds or calling each other names. We call it the fishbowl. John and Alma are here as our red panelists while Monica and I are our blue panelists. John and Alma, you are first up in the fishbowl. So Monica and I are just gonna listen as you answer a couple questions about how the red side approaches the issue of vaccines. So John, tell us first, how would you describe the quote unquote red side's position on vaccines? And what do you think there is of value in this position? Well, you know, I mean, 
it, there's always diversity in in you know within the red and within the blue sort of conversations but i think that generally speaking um i think that most most reds that i know are people who are not anti-vax but who are pro you know, freedom of choice let's say in terms of whether or not you want to actually make the decision to have the vaccine right and so you know, mandates on employers and and heavy handed language from the government that says that you have to do this particular thing is something that strikes, I think, a lot of reds and a lot of conservatives as stepping too far into their encroaching too much into personal liberties, that it may be a good idea to get the vaccine. It may be a responsible health choice. But at the end of the day, there is the widest range of things that we do, uh, including just getting up in the morning and getting in your car and driving 75 miles per hour down the freeway each morning to work. Uh, that comes with a certain amount of risk, both to yourself and to other people, and that it's up to the individual to make the decision as to what sort of risk is acceptable and what sort of risk is not, um, you know, for their own for their own person and, and their own interactions with with others. And so, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I think that that I think that that sums it up from my vantage point. But again, most Reds I know uh, are uh, are vaccinated, at least, you know, the ones I, I communicate with. And so there's vaccine skepticism, but I wouldn't say that that is a dyed in the wool principle of the of the conservative position on this. Alma, what do you think? Sure. Yeah. So let me color that in a little bit. Um, I think it is worth separating anti-vaccine sentiment from anti-vaccine mandate sentiment because um, as John mentioned, pretty much any red you meet is is going to be opposed to mandates, but there does seem to be a split. And I've, and I noticed this because I travel between LA and North Dakota um, between an area with uh, more libertarian minded reds, shall we say, and populist Republicans or populist uh, sympathetic Republicans, the libertarians of which um, seem to be very, very pro-vaccine and the populists seeming to be mm, like, a, like a little more skeptical either because they, they don't trust institutions or maybe not modern medicine at all. Some of them didn't even give their kids the traditional suite of vaccine shots. Mm. So I don't know why it's split that way, but I, I'm not a populist. I am on the libertarian side of things. And um, my side as a libertarian is, is just not really a fan of forced medical procedures. <laughs> Generally, that's not like our brand. And what I love about libertarians in conversations like this is that we look at, when we look at a law, we recognize that at the end of every law is the point of a gun, which sounds dramatic, but literally by putting a law in the books, the state is saying that they are willing to send law enforcement out to enforce that law. So this is not about getting a needle in your arm to us. This is about getting a gun put in your face if you don't get the needle in your arm. Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, as John uh, alluded to as well, this is a classic case of what we libertarians call externalities, these consequences of your choices that, that affect not just you and my own, my own little bubble over here, but your neighbor, your mom, like other people that you might get sick. And this is where libertarians have to concede a little bit if they wanna be taken seriously, but they also might say to blues, you know what, there's also externalities of forcing everyone to get vaxxed. Like, do we think that this will increase public trust or is this just gonna seed more conspiracy theories? Do we think that this will aggravate the tensions that have boiled into violent conflicts recently? What kind of precedent does this set for the next time Washington wants to tell you what to do with your body in the name of public health? So if, if that's the libertarian side, I'm, I would say that I'm in lockstep with that. I really see the value in that. Um, while there's every scientific defense for vaccines, I don't see a libertarian defense for vaccine mandates. Mm. Yeah, I mean, thank you. You know, just just as a as a matter of principle, I think that it is good to it is good to be willing to be skeptical about you know, government instructions um, that are broad based, where the state assumes more power than it previously had, because you know, without without skepticism, you know towards the application of government force, you leave the road clear for government to potentially take up much more power uh, than it should and make life more difficult for everybody in the long run. Now, you know, that is that is a broad sort of observation about the value of, you know, I think more sort of conservative, libertarian, small government sort of, sort of position on things generally. 
As far as it applies to the mandate side of things and the vaccine side of things in this particular instance, um, you know, it's it's a little bit it's a little bit hard for me. It's a little bit hard for me to say in in, in some sense. My feeling uh, all along here has been, you know, the conservative side of me here, more skeptical about the mask mandates than than anything else, largely because everybody has had an opportunity to get vaccinated at this point. And yet it has seemed to me like for people who have freely chosen not to get vaccinated, everybody else is sort of being mandated to accommodate that choice in a way that I think sort of intrudes upon personal freedom, you know, in, in that, in that direction. Um, but, you know, these issues are complicated. And I think the fact that it's hard for us all to have certainty in terms of what's reliable information and what's not, particularly when government scientists can disagree, you can have the FDA scientists disagreeing with scientists from the New England Journal of Medicine on whether or not, you know, uh, whether or not vaccines or booster shots are necessary uh, for people who've already had two doses of the vaccine. That's something that the New York Times is reporting on this morning. People just get whiplash. We don't know, you know, who to believe exactly. And so the public trust dynamic that Alma brought up is very much uh, relevant um, because, you know, at the end of the day, it does kind of become a question of, well, do you trust what the government is telling you uh, or, or don't you? And do you trust their intentions? And yeah, it- right or wrong, a lot of people don't. Yeah. Uh, are we inclined to listen to anybody that we don't trust or like? <laughs> I feel like the answer is a pretty clear no. And the the trust goes beyond what's happening in this moment. Like you said, John, it's it's where this is going. What's the slippery slope that we're on? Right. That's a good point. And what about any reservations or concerns that you might have about how vaccine opposition has taken hold in conservative population? Well, look, I mean, I'm definitely concerned about anybody in America, conservative or otherwise, who just sort of, you know, for the people for whom this is true, just do do not trust, you know, vaccines as a a medical uh, uh, procedure. Or, you know, even people who just unquestioningly, you know, um, unquestioningly uh, disregard anything that may come from the public health establishment in terms of guidance uh, on how we ought to be reacting uh, to this vaccine and how we ought to be, you know, uh, responding to it in all sorts of different ways. You've got to think critically, you've got to be skeptical, but you also, you know, can't be stubborn and utterly closed minded, right? That's the point of having a conversation where we can learn from each other. And it is the point of having institutions and and experts that they can provide guidance that we are able to take seriously under consideration. At a certain point, governments do have to make decisions. Um, And so, you know, I think skepticism is healthy. I think cynicism is dangerous. And uh, there can be a fine line between the two. Mm. Alma, what about you when it comes to any potential concerns or reservations? Um, So I've been thinking a lot about this. And actually, as I was exploring this before we got on the call, I pitched some of these questions to a community that I'm in online. It's actually kind of, it's like a fan club for a podcast called The Fifth Column, which you should all listen to. Loosely libertarian, not explicitly. Um, My friend, my friend, John, shout out to John, was talking yesterday really compellingly about how libertarians seem to just flagrantly disregard the concept of duty. Um, duty to our neighbor, duty to our, to our families, to our colleagues. And um, I don't know, this is, I think this is because this, this I'm going to do me, don't infringe on my liberty philosophy really only has one principle, which is don't get, a, don't get in other people's way. But in doing that, sometimes we can err on the side of, um, well, well, we could choose to do no harm, but we also might choose to do no good if that makes sense. Because mm. libertarianism, li- liberty doesn't tell you how to do good. It doesn't teach you how to love people. And it's very important to me to love people. <laughs> I'm a Christian. And uh, some of the greatest libertarian thinkers were not. Ayn Rand, who is a very famous libertarian author, said, I, I think the quote was that uh, Christianity is the kindergarten of communism. <laughs> and I get why she would say that. But I also... Uh, get that Ayn Rand, whom I love, was an absolutely miserable person. She thought that liberty was sufficient for her. And um, if you look at your life, it just, if you look at her life, it just wasn't, she wasn't a happy person. And I don't think that liberty is sufficient for a pandemic either. Uh, As John mentioned, um, 
while your rights are worth defending, there is this, this duty piece. And, and my friend John was saying, if, if you don't couple duties and responsibilities with liberty, then you're setting yourself up for an existence that's kind of sad and dangerous in some cases. So I do think that's a weakness of the red side. Hmm. All right, well, I think now it's time to figuratively switch chairs and put the blues in the fishbowl. So Monica, I'll start with you. How would you see the blues approach to vaccines and what do you see of value in that approach? Well, first, I just want to say, I just want to thank our Reds, John and Alma, because I, I was writing notes, which I didn't plan to do on a podcast because it was just lots of stuff I hadn't considered really insightful. So thank you. Um, you know, I could I could talk about a lot of things with the blue side as I see it, uh, but I'll, I'll focus on one that I think has been particularly valuable through this, what, year, year and a half of crisis and sort of unprecedented disruption of daily life and social life for the entire world, you know, let alone just America. And that is that um, it, it seems like the blue side has been quicker to support and endorse the scientific uh, establishment uh, sort of d decisions that they have made, pronouncements that they have made, um, you know, both the, the, the institution of scientific knowledge and decision making that is more housed in our government, uh, but also the, the consensus such as it is, even in our university and academic system, you know, we have these institutions of, of really incredible research. And what is obviously difficult to accept, right, is that this crisis has had its ups and downs. This, this disease, COVID, came out of nowhere, seemingly. You know, it, it behaved differently. We had to scramble. And I think that it has been very, very good. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's just so funny because it's sort of contradictory to so many other things. But I think it's been good that the blue side has been quick to support and endorse, despite the fact that there's been plenty of missteps, lots of lack of clarity, studies that do appear to contradict each other. But we also have a lot of scientists and researchers and doctors and everyone doing the best they can and trying to get society to band together somehow to defeat this thing. And so that I think has been really valuable. And I'll, I'll leave it at that for now. Mm. Thanks, Monica. When I think about the blue side's position toward vaccine and what's of value there. I guess I first fundamentally think about just life and death. Um, I think to me, the data seems clear that the more people that get vaccinated, the fewer people are gonna die. And I think that's uh, a very compelling reason why as a society, we should encourage and seek what we to do what we can when it comes to uh, you know widespread vaccine adoption. Um, when it comes to mandates, I think that the state sometimes does have a compelling interest in regulating externalities. Um, my understanding is that in all fifty states, in order to attend school. Uh, kids need to get vaccinated against measles, mumps, rubella. I think some states have exemptions for, uh, you know, religious objections and, and things like that. But in general, I think there are lots of public and private institutions that in order to attend them, you need to show uh, a vaccine certificate, uh, you know, showing that your son or daughter uh, has been vaccinated against measles. Um, and I think the reason is because of the nature of uh, communicable diseases, uh, the externalities. If you have uh, children attending who are unvaccinated, they can seed an outbreak, which can lead to millions of people dying. And so I definitely am sensitive to concerns about liberty and overreach. And I think there's an interesting discussion to be had there about what the federal government should do versus uh, states and localities. Um, but I do think there are instances in which public health uh, trumps personal liberty. And I think 
vaccines for children is a, a prime example. And I know the Supreme Court has looked at this a couple times and decided that uh, at least pre-existing uh, requirements were constitutional. It'll be interesting to see whether what the Biden administration is doing passes muster, uh, given that it is sort of a, just a executive action without input from Congress. Um, so that's going a little bit deeper into the policy weeds, but I just think uh, what's fundamentally good about, you know, a, a, a lot of liberals approach is that it's, um, yeah, collective action first. You're not just getting vaccinated to protect yourself, but you're getting vaccinated to uh, protect others. And regardless of what the intention of a choice to not get vaccinated is, the impact is more death and more harm. Mm. Um, Monica, what, what reservations and concerns do you have about your position or the position of you and fellow blues? Yeah, this is where I'm, this is where sort of my heart hurts folks. So I'll, I'll try to be, I'll try to be candid, but also kind of forceful about this because I feel very strongly about it. For me, it is basically part of the blue side's position that those who are vaccine hesitant are beneath contempt. And you see that with the stereotypes, you see that with a sort of dehumanizing, demeaning superiority uh, with which many influential blues talk about this uh, and talk about folks who are vaccine hesitant. I find that completely abhorrent and unacceptable and unproductive uh, and wrong, <laughs> just frankly. <laughs> I think it's terrible. I think it's sort of the dark side of feeling so self-assured, feeling like data is on our side, you know, data is on the blue side, science is on the blue side. And this, this way of thinking about things makes it, I think, far too easy to then say, we're the good guys, they're the bad guys. And, and that's awful. Um, and I, I think one of the things that maybe I see in that, that makes me most disturbed is um, I, I believe that there is in the blue side too much of an assumption that those who are vaccine hesitant for any of a number of reasons, a number, a huge range of reasons, that they don't care about taking care of society, that they don't want to do good, that they are selfish, that they don't have this value of community, that they don't value public health. And I just think, again, that is such a narrow-minded way of looking at I, I think of it as values blind, you know, like, like there's, there's values at play and there's just a couple of them. There's really just this one. And so, you know, I, as a blue don't see reds really stepping up to this value. So clearly they're just, they're just bad and they're hurting us. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't want to imply with this critique I'm offering that, you know, that there isn't some truth to the idea that, Hey, you know, Maybe if you're not getting vaccinated, there's a way that you might be, you know, causing harm or like, you know, making everyone else have to accommodate your decision. I am very open to that. I am a blue. I believe people should get vaccinated. I'm like, that has not wavered. But when I look around and I see the lack of the lack of respect and the way we're talking about people, almost like second class citizens, I'm just, that is not okay. Uh, so that is my that is my number one concern. Uh, last thing I will say is um, yesterday I had, I think the privilege and honor to talk with two braver angels in Tennessee, uh, one red and one blue. And they recently came together uh, on the day of a school board meeting in their community that was about mask mandates for children. Um, one of them, Beth, uh, who is a blue, had, had made this conviction to herself after the 2016 election that she would never again talk about people she didn't understand, she would talk with them. And so she, ta she tapped her network and she found um, this woman she spoke with, who I'm gonna keep anonymous out of um, respecting her wishes. Uh, and they had a conversation that day. They thought it was gonna be a half hour, it turned into an hour and a half conversation. And they, they, it was so rich. And I, I talked to both of them about what they learned. And it really, really struck me. And speaking with the woman, um, the woman who's on the red side, uh, about this and her position. It was again, sort of so clear to me. It was so clear to me that when you talk to people who are hesitant about any number of things around COVID, your assumptions are wrong every time. 
it's too easy to make toxic assumptions about people's reasons for, for their hesitancy. And I believe that the blue side is doing a really terrible job of being open and of listening and of working with instead of against. Um, and this two-sided thing has got to stop. So, okay, that's it. I'm off my, uh, I'm off my little soapbox. <laughs> Carry on. Preach. <laughs> Thanks, Monica. Yeah, it's notable to me how sort of more forceful and deeply felt your concerns and reservations seem to be than, um, you know, what you expressed in terms of what you see in value. Um, yeah, I agree, Monica, with most of, of what you said. I think that, you know, if you turn on MSNBC, certainly like, you know, the way they talk about unvaccinated people is uh, kind of appalling. And it's also like inaccurate. I mean, the, the, the unvaccinated on, on MSNBC are basically only, you know, Trump supporters, whereas the unvaccinated population is, is quite diverse uh, ideologically and racially and, and everything else. And, and I agree, like, there's all sorts of reasons that people are not vaccinated. Um, and I think not only is this approach, uh, you know, unproductive, I think it's counterproductive. <laughs> if your goal is to get more people vaccinated, right. um, you're just going to drive them further from getting vaccinated by painting them as bad people versus trying to listen to their concerns and, and build trust. Um, and I don't know, I, I, again, I don't think this is really all liberals approach. I just think it's sort of the loudest in, in the media. Um, and the last thing I'll say is I, I think, you know, it, it's not fair to, you know, I, uh, kind of impugn people's intention as a large group when you don't really know the people. Um, but I think it is fair to try to be clear eyed about assessing the impact uh, of people's decisions, um, especially when it's, you know, life or death. And um, especially when I think a lot of this vaccine hesitancy uh, with COVID is far more widespread than it is with other vaccines. You know, that's not to say that there wasn't, you know, strong communities of vaccine skepticism before, um, you know, especially in certain like strange elite Hollywood circles uh, about, you know, some people suspected a tie to autism. Um, but that skepticism was just as a percentage of the population so much lower. I think what's really troubling to me is that I think a lot of this, the, the conspiracy theories have run rampant. And also just the fact that um, just this sort of like vaccine pride has become baked into liberal identity. I think there's a lot of um, vaccine opposition that has become sort of tied into political identity on the right, uh, where, you know, if you're if your identity is, is so deeply informed by your opposition to liberals and liberals are the ones telling you to get vaccinated, I think there are some people who are just going to say, I'm not going to get vaccinated because that's what the liberals are telling me to do. Even if in a vacuum, uh, they might be perfectly happy uh, to get the vaccine. Um, so you have people who are li literally dying to own the libs. Is, is what you're what you're saying no literally like uh, thousands and thousands of people i mean there's all those stories right about um you know like there's conservative radio hosts who have been telling everyone not to get the vaccine and then they get sick and a lot of them then sort of recant and say oh no actually i wish i had gotten vaccinated um but again those stories are often told with so much kind of like derision by liberals of like and just the idea that like, you know, unvaccinated people getting sick is somehow like moral comeuppance, I think it's just oh, like yeah. the, oh. the oh. exact, you know, opposite of uh, how we should be behaving morally and also how we should be behaving if our goal is indeed, you know, widespread vaccine adoption. Yeah, I'm um, so glad you brought that up because that is just, ugh, ugh, <laughs> don't get me started, awful. Yes. Um, well, now let us shift to the section of this conversation in which we get to ask questions of one another to get curious. Um, so John and Alma, we'll start with you and maybe Alma, I'll, I'll start with you and then go to John. 
Uh, what questions might you have for me and Monica um, based on what you heard over the past, uh, you know, 10 minutes? Um, oh. Well, Oh, oh, Alma, go ahead. John. I was going to start with, with you said, Alma. Let's yeah. start with Alma. Your oh, yeah, name yeah. is Alma. Alphabetic, <laughs> alphabetical uh, order. That's right. Go for yes. it. Yes. <laughs> oh, no worries. Um, well, Kieran, it, it's interesting that you mentioned this um, mentality that some Reds have of just like, well, if the Blues told me to do it, I'm not going to do it. Arms crossed, which I actually kind of relate to as a contrarian, not so much just Blues telling me to do anything, but um, people telling me to do, <laughs> to do anything in life. I'm not good at taking orders. Uh, but it, it made me think about how uh, Kamala Harris actually, what it would have been about a year ago in the Democratic debates, she said that she wouldn't take the vaccine if it were Trump recommending it. And to me, this exposes, excavates a little bit more how much the issue is really just about public trust. So I wonder, it made me wonder how you guys would feel if Trump won in 2024 and mm. started mandating a certain behavior or mandating even like an extension of the existing public safety measures that we have, some medical procedure to protect people from any number of things. How would you be digesting this if it weren't a blue in office? Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. It's a question of trust. I mean, you know, if Trump was out there telling me to take something, I, I would be a lot more inherently dubious, uh, you know, based on his, you know, past behavior and voluminous history of, of making false statements for political gain than I would be, you know, trusting a statement by uh, Pfizer and Moderna that's been made after, you know, rigorous clinical double blind controlled studies. Um, so I think it is a question of, of trust and also a question of like, what are you basing that trust on? Is it based on your like uh, emotional connection with a politician or is it based on your reading uh, or understanding of the scientific consensus as best you can? And that speaks to what Monica mentioned. Um, you know, a lot of people just really don't trust the medical establishment just as much as they don't trust the, the government. And there's certainly a history of uh, the medical establishment leading people astray. Uh, but there's also a question of uh, a history of just incredible uh, medical advances that have saved millions of lives. And I think that's what you're seeing now with the COVID vaccine. Sure. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's, it's interesting because my dad is actually a statistician for clinical trials. <laughs> so clinical trials are his thing. He's one of the top guys at this in the whole world. And it's been interesting to get his perspective. He is very deeply blue himself. Um, but it's, it's odd because it's as though you mentioned, you know, you, you would trust Pfizer and Moderna, the rigorous data seeking. Yes, we like data. But do you think that Pfizer and Moderna, Moderna don't have incentives to, for example, like mm. tell everyone that booster shots are super necessary? Suddenly we've lost our corporate skepticism over here, which I thought that, you know, I, I think of blues as being really strong in, you know, skeptical of corporations trying to sell you on something. Let me, um, if I can go back and answer your question, Alma, because it's a really good question. Oh, um, please do. Where you said, yeah, if, if Trump were elected in 2024 and he mandated something, how would you feel? And it's, it's a very insightful question. My answer is I would be loads more skeptical than if a, van if a mandate came down during a blue administration. Um, and, you know, to be as accurate as I can, as I answer this question uh, and as candid as I can, the bias that I have toward Trump, right? The things that I concluded based on watching his administration is I, I attached his administration to things like, you know, incompetence in my head to a lack of, of caring for the country. He only cared for his side. These are my biases, right? I'm being, I'm being forthright about that. But, but as a result of those biases, a mandate that would come from his administration would immediately go in my head to the hell no bucket. And then I would need to do the kind of research that takes me from the hell no to the okay. And the level of research that I would need to do to go from that deep in the, in the red, you know, but in the sort of financial way, like to go from that deep over here all the way to where I'm okay would be a lot of research. But a mandate that's coming down in Biden administration, this is all about trust, right? Biden, my bias toward Biden is, well, he's, you know, he, 
he's not in it for himself. He's very self-effacing. He's more humble. I trust that he's more competent because he's been around longer. He holds my values at heart. So how much research would I need to get me into the, oh, I'm okay with your mandate, Biden. Very little, very little, right? Yeah, and the only thing I would I would add is that I, I completely agree. And I just think my impression is that over the last 10 to 15 years, the Republican Party has just become a lot more anti-science uh, as a matter of political expedience. Um, sort of, there's this uh, kind of anti-intellectualism that I think has run through the Republican Party uh, over the past 15 years. And I think that's manifested in uh, trying to castigate uh, scientists as like authoritarians um, in some ways. And I think you've seen that with climate change in particular, um, not just a questioning of the science, but sort of a, an implication that uh, scientists are really working for Democrats and they're putting their conclusions first and then trying to find data uh, to back it up. And so I think there's also like, uh, what is your fundamental relationship to uh, science as a notion, right? The experimental method. Um, and then also science as it's practiced in a political context, because obviously scientists have their own biases uh, and they want, you know, uh, vaccines to work out. Um, but I think your question, Alma, about the corporate skepticism is, is really well taken, because I think a lot of times it's easy for Democrats to be skeptical of corporate power. Uh, but when the corporate power is the one delivering on their interests, it's uh, a lot harder to be skeptical. Um, John, uh, what is your question, your spicy question for <laughs> me and Monica? Well, uh, my question is pretty simple. Uh, I am curious to know what you guys made of President Biden's uh, speech the other day, uh, announcing, you know, the, the I guess the rollout of these these mandates. Uh, you know, I, I listened to it. Um, I was, you know, I think I was making dinner for the kids, and I had it playing on my, you know, phone off of off of YouTube, and uh, I, I was I was struck by the fact that uh, you know, President Biden wasn't just forceful, but he he really did seem to sort of, you know, single out the unvaccinated, and obviously, you know, sort of the, the folks on folks on the right who are strengthening that that position in a way that I wouldn't blame a lot of folks for feeling like, oh, my God, he's the president of the United States is targeting me right now. There's a certain point in which he said something along the lines of, you know, we have been patient, but our patience is one is wearing thin. And it's sort of like the type of thing that your your dad or your grandpa says before he takes his belt off and you know, comes, <laughs> comes at you with it, right? And uh, yeah, so look, I'm not coming out of the gate here trying to slam Joe Biden because you can easily make the case that you know, but yeah, but look, you've got lives on the line, so the president needs to be firm, forceful, et cetera, et cetera. But it was a remarkable speech, I thought, in terms of seeming to set a dividing line, um, e even if for for the best reasons, perhaps. Um, so I'm just curious to know how you guys responded to it. Yeah, I just pulled up the speech. There's a part where he says, you know, there's nearly 80 million Americans not vaccinated in a country as large as ours. That's 25 percent minority. That 25 percent can cause a lot of damage. And they are that line. Uh, they cause the damage and they are they are causing the damage. It's, you know, anytime that that trust becomes an issue in society, uh, we kind of have to start talking about what truth really is. What is truth, right? And so in that sentence is a very interesting set of assumptions. Um, the unvaccinated are causing the damage. The unvaccinated are killing us. The unvaccinated, right? You can kind of like stretch that out, but what he's doing is putting the source of the harm on the unvaccinated, right? And so there's a case to be made. I understand it's one, it's one interpretation, right? But is it truer? than saying that the Delta variant of a new disease called COVID is causing the harm and is killing us and is the damage, right? So, so when, you, when you take that source of harm and you put it on 80 million Americans, what are you, what are you doing? <laughs> so so you, heard, you heard my, uh, my fairly forceful and heartfelt kind of a concern with my side. 
it, it absolutely stretches to this speech. I, I try to understand the impatience. The impatience is warranted, you know, because it's true. I, I believe this to be true. If we were all vaccinated, fewer of us would die. There's no question. If we were all vaccinated, fewer lives would be lost, you guys. <laughs> There's no question, you know? And so, but it's just not as simple as saying, therefore, you know, A equals A, B equals B. Therefore, the unvaccinated are killing us. It's not that simple. I refuse to take that logical leap. And so I, I believe personally that it was too much uh, for Biden to be quite so, to, to put the blame quite that way, even though I understand the impatience because his job, you know, I'd like to think that our leaders' jobs are to protect us in some way, but, but you know, but, it, it, but protecting us also means making sure we can live our lives. <laughs> and it's just not easy. Hmm. So Kira, yeah. I, I agree. I mean, I sort of felt like he was condemning, uh, you know, millions of Americans. And I, I, I seem to remember, I thought there was like a part where he was like, grow up. He said, grow up to people who are unvaccinated, uh, which like, I guess in a way is like very Biden-esque, like when he tries to be the tough guy, but is like very condescending because, you know, it's basically accusing them of, of being uh, children, infantilizing them. Uh, I thought it was a very political speech, uh, kind of cynical in some respects. I mean, I'm not sure that like shaming people is going to get them to take the vaccine. I think it might harden opposition. I think if your concern is about, I mean, the the most effective way to get people to uh, take the vaccine who are currently opposed to it is through coercive uh actions changing incentives right if you if you don't take the vaccine you're going to lose your job like that's regardless of the morality or whether you feel like that's fair or right that's that is like uh going to be more effective uh than either shaming them or you know trying to undertake careful trust building exercises mm -hmm. um but i think biden also i mean i think he was like um i think democrats see the vaccine as like a winning issue Right. I mean, I think that's how they like want to run in, in 2022. They want to paint Republican candidates as Trump supporters and anti-vaxxers because the majority of Americans are pro-vaccine, not anti-vaccine. So I think Biden was like trying to shift attention away from Afghanistan um, and, and put it back on like, you know, a winning issue for him. Um, and uh yeah, it's just unfortunate because it sort of cuts against his whole brand, which is like come together and be uh, empathetic. And it did sort of have that like, we've tried being nice, you know, and now now it's time to uh, drop the hammer. Uh, and I think a lot of Democrats like that. I think a lot of Democrats were like, finally, you know, like I've had enough. This is what I want to see out of the, the president. I want to see mandates and I want to see him, you know, Call, call things out the way they are. Um, and I certainly understand that impulse, but I think certainly from a, a trust building perspective, it's, you know, it, it kind of just plays into uh, what conservatives have been saying all along, which is that, uh, you know, liberals don't respect their choices and are ultimately going to force things down their throat if they don't fall in line. Yeah. Um, I so. can say one more thing to that too. Um, so there's a, po there's a point in Biden's speech where he said, my message to unvaccinated Americans is this, what more is there to wait for? What more do you need to see? And then he kind of lists things. We've made the vaccinations free, safe and convenient, all that stuff. The FDA is approved, Pfizer, you know. But, but what I want is for those questions to be real questions. Those questions are rhetorical questions, the way he asked them. What more is there to wait for? What more do you need to see? But what if that was a curious question? Mm. What more is there to wait for? What if there's actually an answer to that question that is not ignorant or stupid? What more do you need to see? What if there's actually an answer to that question that is not ignorant or stupid, 
right? Oh my gosh. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm like curious. I have chills. <laughs> I have chills. That's so good. That's so good. It's, it's funny that you say that because I'm actually really inclined toward tough love. I don't really, I don't mind it. And you know, were I on another side of this issue, I feel like I'd be like, yeah, 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 rah, 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 let's go, tough love. Um, but but you're so right, that curiosity um, flips everything. And it's just a tone of voice thing. Wow. Yeah, but but it's it's to what you've been talking about. It's like, there's a sense that we're so, we're so right and we have everything we need. You know, you idiots just need to play along. And that, and to what Kieran was saying is like that, even if, even if, we are right, whatever, the blue side, that won't work. Even if you're right, that won't work. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think the, also like the, the cynical political operative will, will, in me will say, it's like, if you fundamentally believe that the Democrats need to maintain power to save more lives, then they're sort of like the ends justify the means. Uh, which I think in itself is is uh, a dangerous ideology, but I think that's also a calculation that people will make. Like at the end of the day, this is a two party system, and there's such a big difference in terms of this vaccine issue between Democrats and Republicans. So we anyway, uh, I think we should move on now um, and uh, put the uh, the red the reds in the hot seat. Uh, so. Monica, what would be your question for uh, John and Alma? Yeah, um, I had I had mentioned before that the thing that I thought was uh, valuable on the blue side was was a, a closer hewing and support and endorsement of the scientific and research and medical establishment conclusions such as they have been and it, as imperfect as they have been throughout this whole process. So my question to you two is, um, it seems like reds are uh, more skeptical of the scientific establishment, sometimes to the, you know, to, to the degree of having quite a bit of distrust. What do you think is getting in the way of more Reds trusting the scientific and medical establishment during the COVID pandemic and vaccines? Hmm. Well, you know, I, um, I guess I'll jump in. Uh, th there's 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 a number of different things. Uh, part of it, of course, is just the, the the baked in, I think, sort of skepticism towards you know the state, right, and you know the medical establishment, you know, even in non-public, you know, uh, pu public health agencies can be you know, very closely tied to public policy and politics and so forth. And um, you know, th so there's there's kind of a I think a little bit of a built-in disposition to be skeptical, but then, and of course, that is augmented by, you know, polarization media industry that is a serious force on the right, so on and so forth. But then there's the, what appears to a lot of folks as the real politicization of the culture of public health uh, in a way to where, you know, it, it makes people distrust the motivation behind a lot of what comes out of it. So, so take, for, exen for instance, during the uh, summer of protests in the aftermath of George George Floyd. We were already in the lockdown. We were already being told that, you know, protests in the streets were something that, you know, for, for conservatives who were po protesting against the lockdown itself and, and mask mandates and so forth, a risk to public health. And then, you know, shortly thereafter, you had massive protests for racial justice across the country. And you might have expected there to have been a similar reaction from the media and from the public health establishment. Instead, you had you had public health officials um, and people from the medical establishment saying things along the line of, well, you know, uh, systemic uh, racism is a public health threat. And therefore, these sorts of demonstrations are ultimately sort of justified within sort of the framework of, of public health. And you know, in various other things sort of along those lines. And so you got a lot of people who on the right who look at the public health establishment as basically sort of being in the pocket, of the same sorts of elite, liberal, governmental, academic sorts of interests that they distrust in every other area of American life. And, um, you know, that is that is a problem for all sorts of reasons. Uh, but it's not it's not a a reaction that I think is absent any any justification. So, um, yeah, I mean, hopefully that answers some of the question. I wish I had better things to add to that. I feel like you summed that up really well. I've been puzzling over this, Monica, because um, 
my my group of friends in North Dakota over the last two years has shifted um, due to people moving away, just just logistical things. And my my group of friends a year ago was more the engineer types, the the science super. I have a friend up there. Um, we call him the Frackinator. That's the name of his company. I work in oil and gas for people who don't know. And he um, he jokes that he loves every ology except for. Um, except for sociology and psychology. <laughs> and, and this guy- um, in sociology, I'm- <laughs> I remember texting him, it would have been probably about a year ago, a little bit less. And I was like, how are you doing? How are you doing, man? He's like, oh yeah, you know, just waiting. Me and my wife are just waiting to be vaccinated. And so in my mind, I was like, oh, these guys aren't anti-vax. Like they, North Dakota, we're just as pro-vax as anybody else. And my roommate at the time, you know, he, I don't think he was vaccinated, but uh, he's certainly not opposed to it. And then gradually my, my group of friends shifted to a more like blue collar salt of the earth group, the mechanics, the truck drivers. And I found sentiments that I had never seen in the state of North Dakota in my entire time working in oil and gas. And it was so interesting to me. And I don't have an answer. I don't know what it is that makes, you know, Bob, the, the, the mechanic think that vaccines cause autism. You have kids who literally, or excuse me, you have people who literally have autistic kids who attribute the, the, uh, the, their child's genetic, what is it? Um, their, their child's autism to their immunization shots when they were a child. And I don't know where that comes from. I certainly don't know how to argue it because um, if you are that skeptical, you've done a lot more research than the person who just accepts the consensus. Well, and so in the face of that, like I found it very difficult to converse with them and I've been more just in question mode. Thanks. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned that. I'd be curious to hear what you guys think about the school analogy. Do you think the government should be able to require, uh, to, to, to tell schools that they need to require, uh, you know, basic vaccinations for students to attend? Um, and then if so, like, is there a difference between that and COVID mandates? That's, that's really interesting, Karen. I thought that was a really compelling point. Um, do you guys know the concept of Lindy? Are you familiar with what Lindy means? No. Okay, it's kind of a niche, uh, like a Twitter subculture. Lindy refers to something that has been tested with time. So, um, for example, email is more Lindy than Instagram is. And wine is more Lindy than whatever hipster Celsius water you're drinking from the store. And, uh, and it's, it's not a heuristic for everything and every decision you should make in life, but it does lend itself to trust because if something has been tested through time, you do trust it more. So I think there is a perception on the right that these traditional vaccines, well, they've been time tested. And so it's okay that we, we use the government forcefully in this, in this way and mandate this. Mm -hmm. um, whereas these new vaccines, we just don't trust them. We haven't seen them pan out. There's a lot of uh, uh, fear about fertility in women and, and uh, reproductive health in men as well. And it's true. We don't, we don't have data on these vaccines that go beyond the last year. We just don't. Um, that doesn't mean the data isn't compelling. My statistician father it feels very strongly that yeah, no, statistically this this looks good. We're in the clear, but um, but I see how there how, how you could tease out a material difference. What do you think, John? Well, just to the um, to the question that Kieran um, uh, asked about uh, school vaccinations. I mean, I think that. You know, at, at least in the context of public schools, um, yeah. I mean, yeah, I I got vaccinated for all sorts of things. I imagine that you guys did too. Um, if you went to the public school system, um, I think that it just, I think it makes, I think it makes sense given the fact that there seems to be some capacity for children to transmit the virus, even if they are not very likely to be symptomatic. Although, you know, I, I would probably say that I, I don't know what the statistical breakdown there is in terms of how tr how transmissive kids uh, tend to be. I do think a lot of these questions have principled answers, like I'm giving you a principled answer, but if you were to tell me that the instances of child children trans, you know, transmitting the virus to other people is like 0.0000001%, I, I probably changed my mind at that point. But if it's within some, you know, reasonable, some range of 
frequency that's 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 you know reasonable level of concern yeah i've got zero opposition uh, uh to that um is there another part of it you want me to speak to man i mean i i, I feel like um you know that's where i feel clearest uh, is in is in the uh mandate policy as it applies to kids in schools in public schools in particular yeah i think that makes sense um well i think let's just close out with maybe a 30 second or less takeaway uh from this discussion. I thought it was very rich and I certainly learned something. I love the the concept of, of Lindy. I mean, I think certain <laughs> ideas stick around because uh, they stand the test of time. I also think there are certain ideas that have been traditional that have stood the test of time that need to be reevaluated in light of uh, you know recent developments. So yeah, 30 second takeaway. Let's go Mani, Alma, John. Yeah, I mean, this was an extremely rich discussion. Um, I think my my big my biggest takeaway is my favorite takeaway with any of these, which is something that I thought was simpler has become even more complicated. Uh, and I usually celebrate that. So thank you for complicating my view of this. Mm. Alma. I am so impressed at the empathy that I see in the two of you. And I wish I could just extrapolate that across the entire American population, give them a little bit of dose of, of whatever you're on, because I, I felt really seen. Um, not that I was surprised, but I, I was really impressed by your empathetic imaginations. And um, that was the most striking thing for me today. John. Yeah, well, I mean, same goes, same goes for me. Look, I just, you know, I, I, obviously I love the way we have these conversations and it's you know it's materially significant ultimately i mean we have to be able to communicate across the 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 gulf of of distrust in america in a way that you know gives us the opportunity to not just you know push each other to comply with what you know even one can argue are sensible policies for public health or other things but to get people to to actually feel like they who are represented by the government that we have, by the political culture, the political society that we have, and that their own fellow citizens have their best interests at heart. If we had had that sort of a cultural landscape to begin with, it's very possible that we would have pushed down, you know, we would have, we would have gotten a handle on the pandemic uh, far earlier in the crisis. But because we distrust each other so much, you know, and, it, and of course, when it started, you had a lot of blues distrusting the Trump administration, distrusting some of the same public health officials who they are now supportive of currently under the context of the Biden administration. I, you know, uh, Joy Reid is, I guess, an example of that. She had this Twitter beef with Nicki Minaj where, you know, she was coming down on uh, Nicki Minaj for, uh, you know, hip hop artists for, for, uh, exp for sort of expressing serious uh, uh, mandate uh, skepticism and so forth only to be sort of retweeted from something that uh, herself, Joanne Reed, had, had tweeted out, you know, a year prior during the Trump administration, where she talked about not trusting anything that comes from the Trump administration, not trusting anything necessarily that comes from the FDA, right? Uh, and so, you know, the, the landscape uh, shifts depending on who's in office, but it's the distrust that keeps us from really being able to support one another as a people and protect each other. And so the way we communicate has got to be a huge part of the solution uh to that crisis and you know the way you guys do it in monica uh i'm fully ready to change the constitution so you can run for president one day my friend. <laughs> we need that we need that curiosity that you bring so well to these oh, conversations no. uh, wherever You're we can get it raging so. <laughs> about it there you go that's my take yeah i mean i share all of y'all's takeaways and i think kind of jumping off of what john said People are so conditioned to think about communication, political communication as a way to uh, serve their agenda. And people have been fooled into thinking that the best way to serve their agenda is to demonize and dominate. Um, but really, if you're playing the long game, um, people probably should be doing more of what we're doing. And in the long run, that might actually, I think, uh, Breed, breed more progress and less harm. So with that, why don't we move to the last section of this conversation, 
which is called Building a House United. And I will turn things over to Monica. And wait, I just want to say one thing about Nicki Minaj, because I really enjoyed seeing uh, Tucker Carlson quote <laughs> Nicki Minaj's tweets about how she'd heard from her cousin, cousin in Trinidad and Tobago that her cousin's <laughs> friend's testicles uh, had gotten swollen by the vaccine. Um, it was so and good. I, uh, you know, we've all been there, so we can't <laughs> discount that. <laughs> so uh, uh, <laughs> anyway, on that note, why don't I turn things over to Monica? <laughs> Quite the segue, Kieran. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Um, all right. Well, uh, we are now at the part of the Roundtable podcast where we put one of us uh, Roundtable members in a bit of a hot seat and dig into the challenges and opportunities of this daily work of trying to build a house united in a very polarized time, as we just talked about. So John Wood Jr., National Ambassador of Braver Angels, uh, just an incredible voice in this whole movement. You're working on a big new project, a new podcast called The John Wood Jr. Show. So for the next you know, bit, um, tell, us, tell us about it. Tell us about the, the challenges and the opportunities as you work on this project. And then we'll take a few minutes just to ask you a couple of questions and dig in. Yo, thank you very much for that. Okay, so yes, we are launching the John Wood Jr. Show, um, aiming for the beginning of next month, as you know, Monty, uh, one of the huge issues uh, in launching a new podcast while working for Brave Rangers is that you're always working on seven or eight other things, right? Uh, but uh, that is uh, that is coming, very excited about it. Uh, we've got incredible opening guests, uh, Dennis Prager, Karen Hunter, Dave Rubin, um, many other folks uh, are going to be coming down the pipeline, right and left. And the vision of it, uh, of course. Well, okay. So here's 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 what it really comes down to. Um, I come into these conversations as somebody who has a tremendous, you know, interest in politics and ideas, but somebody who has an even deeper commitment, I think, uh, to people and to figuring out how it is, you know, along the lines of the work that we do at Braver Angels we can set the space for us to genuinely sort of understand each other and develop some trust and goodwill from which we can more fruitfully pursue our, our disagreements. And, um, you know, one of the things I'm learning and it, well, I guess have learned over the course of my, you know, uh, stances, something of a, something of a public you know, figure and, and, and so forth is that, you know, it, there are a lot of really smart people, out in the world. I mean, there really are. I see smart people, you know, on, on Twitter all day long. And I work with, you know, obviously brilliant folks like yourselves and all sorts of other people. And I think that I'm a reasonably smart guy. For me, at least, it is impossible to keep up with all of the information that is out there. It is impossible to keep track of all of the different conversations that are running. It is impossible to keep up with all of the things that are relevant, right, to American politics and American public and democratic life. And yet, Usually when you put yourself out there in the public eye, you know, there's a degree to which at least, you know, people sort of expect you to be able to kind of throw an opinion out there on any given subject. And we often do. Right. Uh, and sometimes the way we make that easy on ourselves is by couching our opinions in terms of, you know, sort of who they're who they're they're aimed at, I guess. Like, let me let me give an opinion on on healthcare, but let me, you know, punctuate it with the observation that Donald Trump is a moron or whatnot. Uh, and, you know, whether I'm studied in the issue or not, you know, that's going to allow me to keep my audience and so forth. That's what I, that's what I mean by that. I'm going to try a different approach, the John Wood Jr. show, right? Rather than trying to mask the fact that I don't know everything, I'm going to be very upfront about it. I don't know everything. <laughs> I don't have the time to study everything that comes down the pike. And when my guests come on, we are likely going to find ourselves talking about issues that I know they need to be challenged on that I'm not going to have perfect information on. But what I can do, first of all, is reason. I can try and figure out, okay, what are you basing your opinions on? Let me see if I can get my guests uh, to be clear in terms of you know their sources, the foundations of their reasoning, and so forth. And two, in trying to hold people to sort of that, that account, uh, can I, you know, can I, can I, can I hold people's feet to the fire in a loving way, right? While still expressing that curiosity and so forth. And as far as my own views are concerned, because I'm going to be giving my opinions uh, on this, on this show, 
you know, I really do want to wrap that in a great deal of in a great deal of humility, just sort of identifying with folks who are listening to me to us right now, who are trying their best to keep up with the issues, who know that at the end of the day, we have to trust other people to know things that we can't to see things that we can't, and to show people that it's okay to have an opinion um, and without certain knowledge, so long as we're clear about what it is we, we do and don't know, what, and why it is we believe the things that we believe, with a mind that's open enough to change, right? So I feel like if I can model that, if I can demonstrate that, I'll be doing more good for the conversation through the John Wood Jr. show than I would do if I was sort of an ordinary pundit pretending to have the answer to each and every issue, right? So, you know. I may have gone a little bit beyond what you asked me, but <laughs> that was what was on my heart to say. No, that's great. That's great. Um, I want to turn it to Alma. Do you have a question for John about his vision, about the podcast, you know, any curiosity you have about how to, how to, how to make this vision manifest? Oh, I'm so excited for this show. I guess, I mean, the only thing that comes to mind for me is who's your dream guest? <laughs> Who are we going to see on the show? Right. Well, I named uh, I named a few people. Uh, there are some folks who I, you know, if anybody wants to start lobbying uh, these people, you know, on social media or elsewhere, I'll go down. I'll, I'll just go down a list. I love for I'll folks, be your lobbyist. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, I would love for you and everybody else to, to call out Jordan Peterson. I would love to have him mm. on the John Wood Jr. show. Uh, Cornell West is somebody who I would love to have uh, a deep conversation with uh, about, you know, all sorts of all sorts of issues and the kind of the spiritual health of our, of our democracy. That'd be um, amazing. Cornell, do it, do it. Okay. Do it, okay. Cornell. Come on, come, <laughs> on come on, come on, man. Let's, let's jump on the mic. Uh, Sam Harris would be a great person to, uh, to, to have on. Uh, ben Shapiro would be great to, would be great to get to him. Mark Lamont Hill, a big fan of the conversations that he's been having. would love to get him uh, on the, uh, on the mic. Um, all sorts of folks we would love to, uh, we would love to talk to. So um, yeah. Yeah. Those are a couple. Right. So in the interest Barack of Barack Obama. Obama, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> That'd be amazing. Yeah, sure. So, Karen, you want to ask uh, one more question, then we'll take us to check out. Sure. Uh, any challenges you anticipate, John, in running and succeeding in this venture? Ah, uh, well, uh, yeah, sure. Just, uh, you know, making time to do this along with all the other things, uh, you know, the four of us got to do, <laughs> right? Uh, between building up the uh, the workshops and, you know, expanding our, our membership, interacting with press and media. As Karen, you've, you've led us so so adeptly in, in that department, getting the music out there more and more. But I think the John Wood Jr. Show can positively interact with all of that. Braver Angels is a huge battleship, y'all. It is a cruiser. Uh, it, is a, it is a cruiser. Just think of the John Wood Jr., as just one, you know, one little fighter jet, you know, on the on the top of the ship that's gonna zoom out there and and you know get a good get a good overview of the waters that we want to cross into. So um yeah, yo, I'm excited about it. Mm, braver flotilla. There you go. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for tying that up. I love it. All right. Thanks, John. We're all excited uh, and just can't can't wait uh, to support you and get this thing off the ground. So Alma, do you want to take us through our checkout question? Close us out. All right. Thanks, Money. Um, here at Braver Angels, we like to say goodbye at meetings the same way we say hello with a question. So I'm going to start with Kieran. Kieran, in 30 seconds or less, what is one silver lining from COVID, either for you or for society? Yeah, well, I guess I'll be a little cliche and, and say gratitude. I think um, I was forced during COVID to meditate on the nature and illusion of control. And I guess it helped me think about trying to control as best I could the things I could control and to let go of the things I couldn't. Uh, like COVID and, and lockdowns and, and also just be grateful for, you know, my general health and the health of those I love and, um, you know, all the things we could do and then excitement for all the things we will be able to do, or at least now are able to do now that uh, things have gotten better. Although with Delta, uh, I don't know if no, I can No, 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 this is silver that. lining time. This is silver <laughs> lining time. Gratitude, gratitude, <laughs> no, <but> gratitude <laughs> presence, 
community and yes. meaning. Yes. Amen. Amen, brother. Uh, Mani, how about you? I'll give, I'll give a personal one. Um, in the early days of COVID, you know, a lot of folks found themselves with, with time at home, not really knowing how to fill it. My entire life, I have been an absolute, a, just abysmal cook. I just no and no and no. And in fact, fun fact, <laughs> I was going to major in biology in college, but then I broke a test tube in bio 105 because I'm so clumsy, ingredients, uh, mixing things with the right amounts, just completely worthless until COVID. I, I was in the kitchen, I, I sat and stared at the cookbooks, I figured it out, you guys. And now I think I'm actually kind of a decent cook and I make really good food and, and I share it with my family and my friends. And it's, it's kind of awesome. So that is, that is a personal silver lining that has like legit surprisingly sort of made my life. Uh, that is so good. I've been getting into Gordon Ramsay videos lately. So if you haven't checked them out, like it's, yes. I'm, yes. I'm right there with you. I could, I can't cook to save my life. I'm working yeah, on it. I make scrambled eggs the way Gordon Ramsay makes scrambled eggs. Oh, great. <laughs> great, great, great. I'll come over sometime. <laughs> John, what's your silver lining? Well, goodness gracious, I feel bad that I didn't learn a new language or, or something like that. By the way, it looks like if we all get together, Kieran, I, I'm thinking you can cook a little bit, right, man? I, I'd hate to think that I'm the person who would have to make make the dish. Although Monty's a good cook now. So I guess the problem, I can cook. The I can cook well. meat. That's okay. it. There I'm really go. good at cooking meat. I, I'm pretty good with breakfast, bacon and eggs. I can throw an omelet together, um, you know, pancakes or whatnot. Anyway, um, my silver lining, well, you know, during the lockdown, I'll say that, you know, so I live in Los Angeles. It was pretty amazing to live in LA and, you know, and, and have like totally clear skies and to be able to get up and down the 405 freeway from like, you know, Los Angeles to the Valley in, in 20 minutes. Like it, that was, that was pretty, that was pretty amazing. Um, I guess more than anything, uh, yeah, you know, appreciation and gratitude for me too. I, I had to spend a lot more time at home with uh, with my family, my wife, and my kids. And I've got an amazing family, and I've got you know me and my wife has three wonderful children who are a lot of fun. But I'm on the road a lot. I'm a bit of a workaholic, as people will <laughs> will know. Um, it was nice. Uh, it's been nice uh, to be able to spend more time uh, with the kiddos, just to see just how how really amazing they are and how incredibly blessed we are to to have them, you know, so Aww, more appreciation for the little people, uh, mm -hmm. in our lives. I'm yeah. sure they have appreciation for you too. Um, as for me, the answer is so easy. I've been talking about this the entire pandemic. I'm going to move my camera so you could see it on the video on, for those on YouTube. This is my treadmill desk. <laughs> nice. <laughs> this thing has, I lost 20 pounds last year without even trying or noticing. I was I didn't like set out to lose weight. I just knew like I got to get a treadmill desk now because I might not be able to get my steps in. And now I'm obsessed. I get like 20,000 steps a day. Friend me on Fitbit, you guys, if you have one. <laughs> 20,000 a day? I, I aim for that. Like, amazing. Yeah, it varies. It varies. And it's hard when you travel a little bit too. But this desk has changed my life. I chill this treadmill any day of the week. Uh, I think even April got one actually for my <laughs> recommendations. <laughs> so DM me on Twitter if you want to know more. But in the meantime, um, so concludes another edition of the Braver Angels Roundtable, where, as Moni said, we dare to talk about politics across the red-blue divide and have fun while doing it. Don't forget to hit subscribe on the podcast if you haven't already. We have a great set of guests coming up, and we're always so excited that you're here. So on behalf of Moni, John, Kieran, and myself, have a great day, everybody, and we will see you next time.